Okay, so I think we're live. Um, I think people should be joining us. I'm hoping that it's all turning out. And um, I just want to welcome people as they live. come. Uh, I think people should be joining us. That's okay. You just threw me for a minute, Sarita. So see, I, I guess I am live. I actually I was coming through another computer. All of a sudden I'm like, oh my gosh, that sounds like me. But um, because it was. So yeah, so thank you everyone for joining us who are out there. We're really excited um, to talk to you today. I am Molly Martsky. I'm with the National Genetics Education and Family Support Program at Expecting Health, and we're part of a genetics network um, along with the NCC, the National Coordinating Center, who's helping to support us in this work. Um, and so as part of Public Health Genetics Week, we wanted to really bring together a couple of family leaders um, to really talk about family health history and not just about really the importance of family health history, but really what that looks like and how that sort of evolved within their families. Um, and so I'm gonna turn it over to Sarita. She can introduce herself. Oh, before I start, I guess, before I do that, Sarita, I just wanted to say that I, um, I have three kids and two of my kids are deaf. So they have that genetic condition and that. Um, so this family health history has been part of our journey as we've kind of gone through this and we can talk about how we've looked at things as, as we've um, kind of discussed that and as they're turning into young adults and where that goes for them as well. So um, yeah, Sarita, why don't you let us know a little bit about yourself? Hey, thank you so much, Molly. Um, so I am Sarita Edwards. Um, I am a, a mom and a wife. Um, my husband and I, we have five children. The youngest, Elijah, was diagnosed in utero with the rare disease, um, Edwards syndrome, which is more commonly known as trisomy 18. Mm -hmm. um, it is a genetic chromosome abnormality. Um, and um, that really started our conversation of, you know, just family history and just really wanting to understand more about genetics. Um, you know, because of a lot of the gaps that we found you know, that we found between receiving our diagnosis um, and coordinating care for him, um, we decided to launch a foundation, the EWE Foundation. Um, and the whole goal was really to try and bridge that gap. Uh, we wanted to provide resources and support to other families like ours, um, just navigating a trisomy 18 diagnosis, but also just navigating, you know, a journey of rare disease and special health needs and medical complexity. And so um, that's what I do in my day to day. Uh, but we, we are excited <laughs> to share that Elijah celebrated his fifth birthday this year. And um, he is scheduled to start kindergarten in the fall. Um, just a bunch of different milestones that we never knew that we would experience with him. So I'm really, really excited to be here and be a part of today's conversation. Yeah, great. Thanks for joining us, Sarita. And Francis, why don't you tell everyone a little bit about yourself? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I'm Francis Beasley, and our journey started with my daughter's diagnosis when she was two with a urea cycle disorder, um, specifically OTC, um, began our conversations around genetics and family health history. Um, her particular diagnosis um, is an X-linked chromosome um, deficiency. So um, girls affected it in, at different, uh, or in different ways because of the extra X to compensate for the X that has the deficiency. Boys affected differently because they don't have um, an extra X to compensate with this X-linked chromosome. Um, so again, our conversation started around that. So with our health history, there were no markers or indicators up until then. So it really places a great responsibility on us to kind of begin the family history because moving forward with her family planning, she is, uh, she'll be 18 next month. So super excited about that. We're planning for graduation in two days uh, from high school. So headed off to college and, and lots of great things. So for the last you know, 50, well, 17 years, but specifically since her diagnosis have just gotten connected to um, genetics, NCC, CERN, all those through our clinic um, and, and through our clinician and, and metabolic geneticists. So we've been excited to, again, just like Sarita said, you know, 
walk together through all these milestones and these important steps in life and get connected and share our experiences. My day to day, I work for Victory Junction, which is a medical camp in North Carolina that serves um, about 10,000 uh, camp experiences every year to kids who have complex medical challenges and um, kind of blending the personal and professional skill sets and passions um, for my day to day work. Yeah, great. Um, so I, I kind of heard it a little bit in your introductions, but I just wanted to preface that that there is, I came across a survey, they said, um, I think it was done in the early 2000s by the CDC, and they and it interviewed 4,000 people, and it was like, how important do you think family health history is? And almost 97% of the people said they thought it was very important, right? Like super important. And then they followed up with and said, um, how many of you have actually done anything about your family health history? How many of you collected anything or asked those questions of, you know, relatives or, you know, tried to find some of that information and less than 30% had done it. So, um, so it is one of those things that, again, I, and that's kind of where I wanted to dive into it, you know, with our conversations um, today was really that it feels like it's pretty, pretty unanimous. And again, in times where people like, aren't pretty unanimous about things that, you know, this was pretty high as far as, yep, people know it and think it's really important to do, but very mm -hmm. few people have done it. So mm -hmm. we, you know, our, I mean, again, I'll be very transparent. Our family didn't do any um, family health history in the very beginning. Mm -hmm. um, and even after sort of our son was born, we didn't necessarily pursue genetic testing for him. Um, he was born with a profound hearing loss and stuff like that. And we just, we guessed that it might be genetic, but it, it, it's different how different conditions and stuff present themselves. And so for us, it, it wasn't necessarily as important as well as the genetic um, testing wasn't quite there at that time. Mm -hmm. So we, we had kind of not, you know, said, okay, that wasn't a priority for us because what it the information it would give us would was not worth that payout of financial, emotional, like actual physical going to doctors and more appointments and stuff like that at that time. But, Molly, do you mind sharing how old your children are? You may have said that and I missed yeah. it. No, I, and I, I don't think I did say that. Um, so my oldest is 24 and so mm -hmm. he is deaf. Then we have a middle son who's hearing and he just turned 21. And then our daughter turns 19 in about two weeks and she's deaf as well. Mm -hmm. So we have the oldest and the youngest, but um, yeah, we really, you know, it's, it's funny when you talked about that, talking about their family planning and stuff like that mm -hmm. and, um, and sort of starting to have some of those conversations as they become young adults and start to right. think about that next piece of their journey. So I was curious about that because thinking about Sarita with your son, who's five, I think you said he was, he was five. Um, and thinking about the, even just in the short, you know, 20 ish years that our kids have, have been experiencing all the kind of care coordination and all the teams on, just to see how the medical community has evolved, how the care coordination teams have evolved, especially when you have a child, you know, who has a rare diagnosis. So there isn't much information, just, you know, it's been really important to us. And Sarita, you're like a, the perfect illustration of just, you know, being a real um, um, megaphone, you know, to help people understand and know that you're there and can share resources, but also just to talk about these diagnoses and these medical challenges that we have as families in a really broad way um, with the technology that's changing so quickly, even today, as an example, to be able to share this information with a broad audience, like that's huge. I mean, that's a really big opportunity for us. And it's a, mm -hmm. a it really impacts their transitions to their self-care. It really does. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It really does. And I think, you know, I think, um, it's really important too, you know, how you highlighted just the um, how much time has mm -hmm. has passed between, you know, all of our kids and their ages, um, um, and how how much things have improved, right? But, but how how 
how so true it is that there is still so much growth that we need. So much improvement is still necessary. Um, you know, I know for us, um, we really didn't have that conversation of genetics or um, really knowing family history. Um, I don't know if it was just, you know, growing up, uh, we didn't talk about family history. We didn't, we didn't talk about it at home. We didn't, we didn't talk about, you know, things that, that we were experiencing as a family. Oh, you know, you know, we, if, if anybody said anything, it may have been, oh, you know, you had an aunt who died from cancer or something right. like that. But it was just that really in-depth conversation. Um, we just, I didn't experience that growing up. Um, and I think even, I think now having Elijah and a lot of the experiences that we have with him, um, I, you know, we are more intentional to talk about it, mm -hmm. you know, with our children. Um, we, we are more intentional to talk about, you know, even with our own diagnoses, you know, we're, yeah. we're more, we're more um, intentional about sharing the different things that, that we're experiencing, um, especially if we learn, you know, this is hereditary or, you know, this is, um, is, is, is genetic, but is, you know, you may not see it just in a, right. um, a, a hereditary component. Um, right. We still find it valuable to share with the other kids. Um, and I don't know if, I don't know if I would have done that so intently had we not had this experience with Elijah. Yeah. And I, I think for, for us, very similarly, we have one side of the family that we know a lot of family history about another side of the family that we don't know much about at all. And so when we were looking at um, kind of not at the time calling kind of indicators, like, you know, yes, someone had heart trouble. Yes. Someone had cancer. Yes. Someone had, you know, these types of, of family histories. Um, and then the other side of the family, we didn't know much about at all. And then, so you kind of prepare yourself when you are, you know, planning your family that things can happen, you know, or, or, it's a very fragile process. Um, and so as you, are you prepared for something that's rare? Are you prepared for something you're not, you know, and, and, and how do then you educate yourself around that? And how do you begin to normalize those conversations? Because um, the medical world has changed. Those advances have been made so that they can care for kids in very different and special ways super early on that we weren't able to do 20 years ago, 10 years ago, five, maybe even a year ago in some cases where they're just these kind of breakthroughs. So um, it's definitely been an experience for sure. But but similarly with Sarita, we didn't really you know talk about it. Um, and I don't think family history is known on my husband's side of the family. It's not known at all. Um, on my side of the family, it's very known. We were very open about those types of things. But now as Gracie approaches family planning stages of life. She's closer to that than she is on the other end. What does that mean for her family planning? What does that mean for her um, as she begins to think about genetics and understand, you know, things differently? Um, it's been a whole new space for us. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting. And, you know, I think that piece of that not knowing some of what goes on, sometimes I think it's deliberate, right? Like, oh, we're just not going to talk about that, right? Like <laughs> nobody wants to talk about that. But then also, I think I found, you know, I mentioned to my mom one time, like, oh, I went to the doctor and I was like, oh, it was so good. I didn't have to check any of those boxes. I'm like, do you, is does this yeah. run in your family? And I was like, oh, I didn't have to check any of that. And I was like, are you serious? Like, do you have this, this and this? <laughs> <laughs> and it was almost assumed because it wasn't intentional that somehow I had, you know, taken in that knowledge, which I, I just never had. I, you know, I didn't know that my grandma had, you know, high blood pressure. I, it just, right. it was not, <laughs> I somehow, you know, again, um, I think she thought, I, I'm trying to think of what that kind of learning is, but you know, it wasn't direct learning. It was just sort of like out there. Like I was going to incidental like osmosis. You were going to pick it up. <laughs> yeah. That I was yeah. Pick it up. Like, hmm. yeah. I think it's just, you know, I think, I think when it comes to family history, I think a lot of times information is withheld in families because it's, you know, it's considered private. This is my personal um, medical history. And I don't, you know, I think a lot of times we miss the value in sharing yes. that information and how important it is for our family members to know, especially, you know, especially those direct family members. You know, I think, 
you know, I, I get if it's like a, you know, a second and third cousin or something, but, mm -hmm. you know, when it's, when it's your direct family, um, you know, and I, I'll share just, just my personal journey. Um, I was recently diagnosed with uterine thyroid. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, you know, one of the questions that they ask is, is there a family history of it? Mm -hmm. And, um, and I was, you know, I responded, you know, to my knowledge, I, I don't know, maybe I had an aunt, maybe, you know, maybe this part, like, I don't really know. And it wasn't until, um, mine, mine is so severe, I'm getting ready for surgery in a few weeks, but, um, it wasn't until I share with my mom that I was going through it, that she, that she shared, oh, well, you know, you know, this person and your grandmother and this, and, and I had never heard it. I had never heard of their experience prior to sharing my own journey. And so I think it's just, I think it's just one of those things to where we just, you know, because it's our medical diagnosis, we don't talk about it. And I think some of that is privacy. You know, we just want to keep it to ourselves. But I think, I think sometimes depending on what it is, um, it's kind of like that embarrassment, like, you know, it, it, I'm like thinking about this, like this is my, this is, you know, this is your girl stuff and right. not everybody wants to talk about it, but I'm an open book. Like I just, I want to raise that awareness and, and talk about it. So now I have a daughter, we have four boys and one girl. So she needs to know, oh, well, my yeah. mom had it. So, yeah. so yeah, I, I do think it's just one of those things. Um, we, we hold our information so privately and so dear to which we should. But I think we do have to recognize the importance of sharing that information with those closest to us. Um, so we know how it spews over into the family, into their homes and, you know, their family planning uh, uh, preparations and all that type of stuff. So, yeah. Um, I, I would add to that, that, you know, one thing that you said, like, where we talk about the value of things like that, I would add that sometimes we don't think that it's important information. And so the value of conversations like this is that it does trigger another thought. And so mm -hmm. if you're saying to your mom, like, you know what, you know, I've been having a lot of pain, or I've been having a lot of something. And, and then, and then she might say, you know, she might make a connection, but then with your diagnosis, then she's like, oh, well, wait a minute you know, your grandmother, she kind of experienced something like that. I wonder if, and so my personal journey with, with breast cancer in our family, um, you know, I have not been, um, tested. Um, my mom had, um, had breast cancer and my grandmother had breast cancer and my great grandmother had breast cancer. And the more we've talked about it and through osmosis, like what you were saying, Molly, just kind of these anecdotal stories that were, have been shared in our family it's likely my great, great grandmother probably had it. We didn't know anything about breast cancer at that time. So the more we evolve our conversations and the more that we approach them from multiple perspectives and, and, and look at them with lots of different lenses, we don't know what's valuable or what's not valuable. So um, Sarita, like, you know, to your point, I'm an open book too. You know, I'm happy to share our personal journey. I'm happy to tell our story. Gracie has been involved in every single one of the conversations that we've had with her um, doctors, her um, nutritionists, her geneticists, her primary care physicians, her dentists. You know, she's been involved in every single one of those conversations so that she can do exactly what you're talking about, Sarita, which is like key off of different things that she may have heard or she may have picked up on so that then she can educate her kids in the same way. Her, my son, her sibling can pick up on other conversations and 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 be educated as well because um, that old adage is true that it it does take a village and so the more that we talk about it the more that we share um, the more someone say might say oh well, you know I remember your your maternal grandmother or you know mentioning something about you know um, I don't know pick it you know. <laughs> any type of thing. And then you're like, oh, well, wait a minute, maybe there was a connection. And so, you know, I think for us, for the families who, you know, have a diagnosis like this, with the medical advances, we're living longer with these diagnoses, we're living longer with these experiences, and we're able to share in brand new ways. And I don't want to miss that opportunity to share. I don't want to miss that opportunity to, to educate people about, about that. So again, kind of, looking forward so that those future generations can feel comfortable, you know, in their own skin as well. So 
I, I think we all agree on the value of it, right? Mm -hmm. um, but we also know that there's so many dynamics that play into families, right? Mm -hmm. And it's it's individualities. It's things that happened before we were born that happened between, you know, your mom and your her brother, whatever, whatever that might look like, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's there's just family stories. So have you guys like encountered difficulties in trying to get family history? Um, I remember when we were trying to like find out and try to pinpoint when Jack was born, like, hey, you know, do we think it was genetic? Because again, at that point, the genetic testing wasn't quite there. So they're like, well, was he premature? Or was he, do you know what I mean? So they started to go through the other checklists of what maybe could have caused his hearing loss. And, and so we brought it up to family and they were like, nope, nobody on our side. Nope, must come from your mm -hmm. side. You know, and we're like, well, with this case, this isn't how that would work with this, you know? So mm -hmm. um, I, I just was wondering if either of you had had that experience. And honestly, that that took me a long time to get over that kind of an attitude when somebody was like, nope, not, mm -hmm. not our side, your side, you know? Um, like it was taboo or uh, something. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Makes you know, holidays I, uncomfortable. I can right, tell you that much. Right, <laughs> exactly. You know, I think, I think for us, I know like my husband and I, we have, when we got Elijah's diagnosis, we got it when I was 22 weeks pregnant. And so we kind of started talking to each other, kind of like, um, and and this was, this was, I think we were just really trying to understand what we were dealing with. And sure. we kind of talked through, you know, so does anybody in your family have, you know, a genetic condition? Does anybody in your family has a chromosome abnormality? And we didn't even know what to start looking for. Right. You know, we were just, we were just having that conversation. Um, I will say, you know, I think, I don't recall ever just asking outright, you know, my mom or my grandmother. I don't, I don't recall ever just asking, um, mm -hmm. did someone have this or that, or do we know of it? I think, I think if it came up in conversation, we might talk about it, but I don't ever remember there being a deliberate conversation about trying to understand what somebody died from or you know, what type of, if someone was sick, well, what's going on with them? Um, you know, um, I just, I don't know if it was, it was, there was just no real intention. Um, mm -hmm. But I think a lot of it, you know, I think is, <laughs> I think it's kind of, you know, uh, it's, it's that cycle of, because it wasn't talked about, I didn't know to explore it kind mm -hmm. of thing. You know, it was, um, I, I, I didn't know, uh, what I was missing out on having mm -hmm. access to that information. So yeah, we just never, I don't think we ever really talked about it. Now my husband, you know, you know, I do know uh, his mom, if he asked a question about something, she would, she would give the information she had, you know, and whatever that information was, she would give it. Um, and sometimes that may include a diagnosis. Um, and sometimes that wasn't even his intention. You know, she just kind of volunteered what she knew about whatever the question was. And so I think we just, I think we have to, sometimes we have to, <laughs> we have to give all we have, even if it's not <laughs> what the person asking is looking for, yeah. because that, that kind of opened up that dialogue or the potential of the dialogue to say, so, well, what about this? And what about this? And what about that? Um, um, especially when there's, when those medical diagnoses are in your family. My husband's mom had sarcoidosis. My mm -hmm. husband's dad had ALS. Mm -hmm. And so those are, those are things that now he and I, we talk about, you know, we, we, we look into it. We want to know more about it. Uh, we want to, Elijah has trisomy 18. So we know that that whole genetic conversation, it exists in our circle, we just have to talk about it more to normalize it. Um, and that's what we that's what we try to do with our kids, but we try to do it kind of like uh, Francis was saying, we try to do it just in an open forum. So mm -hmm. everybody sees the importance in having those conversations. I think that you, what you're talking about, um, I think about two different things. I think that the way conversations happen in families you know, you're either gathered around a table and you're having conversation at a meal or you're, you know, sitting on the front porch and have an organic conversation with your grandparents or mm -hmm. you're sitting down at the table filling out a, a 
a questionnaire about your kids athletics, you know, yeah. so, you know, or you're in your doctor's office, you know, kind of thing. But when you think about how families are having conversation, I think that has changed a lot too now. And so, you know, because our families are going in so many different directions and Molly, you spoke to kind of personality conflicts in your family. Like there could be a, a hundred different reasons why families aren't having conversations about mm -hmm. medical histories. Um, and I think that that it also, you know, we can think about if you're not naturally inquisitive, if you're not a naturally curious person, then you have to be curious on purpose. You have to have yes. a reason to be there. You have to be have mm -hmm. a reason to go in there and say, you know, hey, you know, because because what's happened, you know, like I said, on, on my husband's side of the family, for whatever reason, the history wasn't discussed it could have been as simple as it's just not known. There could have been adoptions yeah. in the family. And then that was as so socially at that time, not something that people talked about. So then, you know, the child at the time who grew up to be the grandparent who, you know, may or may not have known, you know, his or her own family history, his or her own history at that time. Um, and so I think that, you know, we have an opportunity to, to force that curiosity sometimes and to mm -hmm. have a reason to be curious, um, whether it's just bringing us together in casual conversation or organic conversation or really purposeful conversation, which sometimes can be uncomfortable for, again, all the hundred reasons we, you know, identified, but um, being courageous in those conversations too. There's mm -hmm. a lot of, you know, conversation around that right now. Um, that's true. You know, how do you have courage and confidence in your conversations um, to to be purposefully curious yeah, you know, yeah. without, and, without seeming like you're prying, you know, we're not prying. We just want to know how to be healthy and can, right. and, and can what we know now inform a future strategy for us, you know, mm -hmm. can it really get us to a place where we're informing ourselves so that we can inform a different type of care plan or mm -hmm. what resources do we need to have available at birth in that yeah. moment to care mm -hmm. for that? particular child or what resources do we need to have available five years down the road, 10 years down the road? What does Gracie need as she, you know, takes off to college at 18? What does she need to know about her own diagnosis so that she can care for herself and so that we can prepare her to begin that, that journey. So it's, mm -hmm. it's there's so many different variables <laughs> we talking about it. <laughs> yeah. And you, I mean, you really, really touched a lot of really valuable points right there. I think too, you know, um, in having those conversations, those purposeful conversations, we have to call it out for what it is, right? Like I, I know, um, alcoholism, yes. uh, it, it's on, it's on my dad's side of the family. Yes. And, but, but I cannot say I've ever heard anybody call it that. Yeah. You know, oh, like, yeah. like, like mm -hmm. nobody, it, nobody, it. Yeah, yeah, like nobody called it what it is. Mm -hmm. And, and so it just, it becomes, it becomes that cycle of, you know, um, this person just, just drinks on the weekend or this person um, drinks every day. And there's a term for that. And, and, and I think we, you know, I think we run from uh, the truth of what it is, because we don't want to kind of bring that exposure to ourselves. Mm -hmm. But but how can you proactively get in front of it long term right. for your entire family, unless you call it for what it is? You know, yes. it's, it's just you have to call it out for what it is. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this half an hour just flew by. You oh, knew wow. what it was going to, right? Like yes. you would. I am. Um, I was so excited that you guys were able to join us today and um, be part of my first Facebook Live. So I hope it went well. But um, I did want to leave people that there are some tools and great resources out there for collecting family history. Um, you can look up, does it run in the family? That was one of the, that's a really good one. So it kind of broaches this and give sort of that template about how to have these conversations. If you're wondering where to start and what, you know, where to go and stuff like that. Um, you can always feel free to reach out to me at the family center and um, yeah. Thank you again, you two for joining me today, for sharing your stories. Um, I always learn something every time we get together and I really appreciate it. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.